Good evening and welcome to the third and final presentation of our Lenten Parish Mission. Our speaker tonight is known to all of us, but not all of us really know him, his background and his accomplishments. Father John Dillon was ordained the priest of the Archdiocese of Washington in 1998 by James Cardinal Hickey. Instead of going to Disney World after being ordained, he actually went to Hollywood. <laughs> he went to St. John Francis Regis Parish in Hollywood, Maryland. And from there, he went to the Church of the Little Flower in Bethesda, Maryland, and then south again to St. Joseph Parish in Pomfret, first as administrator and then as pastor. From there, he went to St. Mark the Evangelist Parish in Hyattsville as pastor. To our great joy and thanksgiving, he's been our pastor here for almost nine years at St. Francis of Assisi in beautiful downtown Durban. Now, Father John is currently has a number of responsibilities beyond just being a pastor. He is a member of the Diaconate uh, Formation Review Board for the Archdiocese, the chaplain to the Courage Apostolate for the Archdiocese of Washington, chair of the Religious Education Advisory Board for the Archdiocese. He's part of the diaconate faculty teaching new deacons and the dean of the Upper Montgomery County East Deanery for the Archdiocese. So you see he's the dean or vicar foreign, as you might see after his name. He's a native of Butler, Pennsylvania. Everybody from Pennsylvania is wonderful. <laughs> Guilty. Um, and so Father John is also a scholar who graduated with honors from Villanova University with a major in classical languages. He went on to earn both a Bachelor of Sacred Theology and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Greek and Latin from the Catholic University of America. Many may not know it, but the official language of the Catholic Church is Latin, so all documents, official documents come out in Latin and get translated into the various local languages. And for years, Father John was the official translator uh, of Vatican documents, both coming from the Vatican and going to the Vatican in Latin. So please welcome our pastor, Reverend, Do Reverend Dr. John Dillon, a.k.a. Father John. <laughs> Thank you, Deacon Jim, for those words of welcome. Now, going back to my days in, from Butler, Pennsylvania, I had the same English teacher, both as a sophomore and as a senior, Mrs. Becker. And we had what we called Mrs. Rules, Mrs. Becker's Rules of Composition. I'm going to break one of her rules tonight. <laughs> one, the rule meaning you always wait until you finish the talk before you come up with the title, because we need to have a title pretty early on for things, and so. What I'm going to talk about, I mean, it's, going to, it's going to be more, more encompassing that you will be expecting with the title, which was Proclaiming the Primacy of Christ in the World Today, Thoughts and Enunciation. I'm going to do that, but a little bit more as well. Now, several months ago, we had a presentation by Dr. Susan Timoney, who was uh, formerly uh, Secretary for Pastoral Life in, uh, at the, uh, the Archdiocese, now is a professor at Catholic University. And she was talking about a document called Living as Missionary Disciples, a Resource for Evangelization. Now that document came about popes since, you know, for 50 years or more. Uh, pope St. Pius, St. Paul VI, St. John Paul II, Benedict XVI, Pope Francis have talked about the need for evangelization. And so, about, I guess about 10 years ago, the Bishop's Conference said, we better do something about this. So two committees at the Bishop's Conference Evangelization and Catechesis developed uh, this wonderful tool called Living as Missionary Disciples. Now in the banner behind you, you can see there are four movements with this. Encounter, accompany, build community, and send. And actually during this year of our 50th anniversary, we've been using those various themes each month. This month, the theme is an enc is encounter. And so I want to talk about that in particular. Now, what do we, 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 whenever we talk about encounter, what do we mean? Well, the way the document talks about it, a useful way to think about encounter is to see the Lord extending his hands to us in welcome, in friendship, and in love. Now, the Catholic Church offers many ways in which we can experience our Lord intimately. It might be through prayer. It might be through the sacraments. 
might be through Eucharistic adoration, reading of the scriptures, or it could be in works of mercy. So tonight, what I want to do is look at what encounter looked like in six individuals throughout church history. I'm going to start with our Blessed Lady on the, for the Annunciation. So that's, uh, that, that part goes right in with the talk. Now, a couple days ago, I wrote, we wrote in a flock note how the Blessed Virgin Mary, you know, had this experience, well, she had this experience with the Lord, causing her to proclaim the greatness of the Lord and to put the will of God first. Christ became primary, primary, primacy, all right? Putting the will of God before all else. Uh, after then, I'm going to look at a uh, great 12th century uh, abbot and doctor of the church, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, his experience of encounter. And then I'm going to work with four other French saints and blessings as well. Uh, Vincent de Paul, Louise de Marillac, uh, Rosalie Rondeau, Frederick Austin, and on their experience of encounter. Now, today we celebrate the Solemnity of the Annunciation, and it's a, it's a particular day, it's the day as Deacon Jim is this closing stations remind us about the consecration Pope Francis has called for of the Ukraine and Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And hopefully we, we, did, we did that at the end of stations, did this morning at Mass as well, and we invite anyone who's not done it today to, to do that. I think that's it's really very, very important. Now, the, the other day in the flock, you know, we talked about how Mary may have had her own plans for her life. When the angel Gabriel appeared to her and delivered some really incredible news, that she would conceive a son and would name him Jesus, that he'd be called Son of the Most High, that he would receive the throne of his father David, and his kingdom would have no end. Now, Mary understandably questioned, how could this be? Now, she was betrothed, to Joseph. Now that betrothal meant more than means today. It means they, they technically they were married, but they hadn't been living together. How could she be? Uh, but then in the next breath, she demonstrated her total devotion, trust, and faith in God. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. All right? Putting God first. All right? Now, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, abbot and doctor of the church, had a very deep devotion to Mary, and he wrote about the encounter of the angel Gabriel with Mary of Nazareth in one of his homilies. I'm going to read that homily to you, because this is really what I was thinking about. It's not, from the office, it's not in the Office of Readings for today. We actually had this just before Christmas. But it's a homily called In Praise of the Virgin Mother by St. Bernard. And I like it because it really slows down this encounter. The angel has just made this, and we're waiting for her answer. So this is what Bernard does with that. You have heard, O virgin, that you will conceive and bear a son. And you have heard it will not be by man, but by the Holy Spirit. The angel awaits an answer. It's time for him to return to the God who sent him. We too are waiting, O lady, for your word of compassion. The word of the sentence of condemnation weighs heavily upon us. The price of our salvation is offered to you. We shall be set free at once, if you consent. In the eternal word of God, we all came to be, and behold, we die. In your brief response, we are to be remade in order to be recalled to life. Tearful Adam, with his sorrowing family, begs us of you, O loving virgin, in their exile from paradise. Abraham begs it, David begs it, all the other holy patriarchs, your ancestors, ask it of you as they dwell in the, in the country of the shadow of death. This is what the whole earth waits for, prostrate at your feet. It's right in doing so, for on your word depends comfort for the wretched, ransom for the captive, freedom for the condemned, indeed, salvation for all the sons of Adam, the whole of our race. Answer quickly, O virgin. Reply in haste to the angel, or rather, through the angel, to the Lord. Answer with a word. Receive the word of God. Speak your own word. Conceive the divine word. Breathe a passing word. Embrace the eternal word.
Why do you delay? Why are you afraid? Believe, give praise, and receive. Let humility be bold. Let modesty be confident. This is no time for virginal simplicity to forget prudence. In this matter alone, O prudent virgin, do not fear to be presumptuous. Though modest silence is pleasing, dutiful speech is now more necessary. Open your heart to faith, O blessed virgin, your lips to praise, your, um, your womb to the creator. See, the desire of all nations is at your door, knocking to enter. If he should pass by uh, because of your delay, in sorrow you would begin to seek him afresh, the one whom your soul loves. Arise, hasten, open. Arise in faith, hasten in devotion, open in praise and thanksgiving. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, she says, be it done to me according to your word. I think that's just magnificent. Uh, really, really spelling out the encounter so very, very well. But this was, this is part of the work of, after this piece, Bernard uh, himself uh, had an encounter with the Lord when he was in early, his early 20s. Now, Bernard was the middle child in a large family of a pious knight and his wife. Received a very, very good education. His Latin uh, is, is, is wonderful. You just have to take my word for it because to talk about that uh, could get very, very technical. Uh, so let's just take it my word. His Latin is good, all right? Now, on Easter Sunday in the year 1112, there was a commotion at a poor monastery, at the door of a poor monastery of Citeaux in, in Burgundy, in France. Burgundy is, of course, famous for wine, too. Uh, now, outside, there was a crowd of noblemen who wanted to enter the monastery. The reason? Because of their relative and friend, Bernard. Now, Bernard was attracted to this monastery. It was a new foundation. It was only about 20 years old. It wasn't doing all that well. Uh, because it was more flexible in comparison with older and more established monasteries. At the same time, it was stricter in its practice of the evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Now, in Burgundy, there was already a very famous monastery called Cluny, which had become, which had been around for a much longer period of time, become very, very wealthy, very, very famous. Uh, and Bernard did not feel he was called to live that kind of life. He thought what he heard about Citeaux would be the place. Well, the 30, 30 men entered, and it changed the whole character of the monastery. At that point, it was too big. So the abbot said to Bernard, you've got, you've got, you've got talents and abilities. I'm going to send you to be the founder's foundation of a daughter foundation. So at the age of 25, he became the abbot of a new foundation at Clairvaux. Well, this is why we call him Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, that's where he spent the rest of his life. All right. Now, as Bernard looked at the discipline, way of life at other monasteries, he recalled the need for a sober and measured life, uh, and, how, and the food that was served, not wealthy and rich food, but simple, uh, simple fare, you know, not elaborate clothing, you know, uh, and not, not, fa not, not great monastic buildings, and there also had to be the support and care for the poor. All right, Clairvaux flourished and in, in fact established a number of daughter houses. So by the end, by the end Bernard had died, this assertion reform of the Benedictines has become uh, very, very well established. Now, during the 12th century when Bernard was living, there were complex battles between philosophical currents at the time. In the midst of these struggles in the culture of his day, Bernard was ever the theologian, the contemplative, and the mystic, trying to bring people back to the Lord. So Jesus alone, he said, was the answer. For him, Jesus alone is honey in the mouth, song to the ear, jubilation in the heart. On one another occasion, after encountering the, philosoph philosoph the philosophic argumentation of the day, he said, all food of the soul is dry, unless it is moistened with this oil, insipid, unless it's seasoned with this salt. 
when you, when you write has no savor for me because thus I've read Jesus in it. Because that's where the savor comes from. Now, in an address from several years ago in St. Bernard, Pope Benedict XVI notes that for Bernard, true knowledge of God consisted in a per personal, profound experience of Jesus Christ and his love. And he goes on to say, and brothers and sisters, this is true of every Christian. Faith is first and foremost an encounter, underscored word, with Jesus. It's having an experience of his closeness, his friendship, and his love. It's in this, this way we get to know him better, to love him and to follow him more and more. May this happen to each one of us. Now, Bernard was also well known for his love and veneration to, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, I, I read to you from one homily, so listen, this is an excerpt from another one, which I think is really magnificent. In danger, in distress, in uncertainty, think, uh, think of Mary, call upon Mary. She never leaves your lips, she never departs from your heart. So that, you, so that you may obtain the help of your prayers, never forget the example of her life. If you follow her, you cannot falter. If you pray to her, you cannot despair. If you think, on, think of her, you cannot err. If she sustains you, you will not stumble. If she protects you, you have nothing to fear. If she guides you, you will never flag. If she's favor to you, you will, you will attain your goal. In this phrase, if she protects you, you have nothing to fear. I think about this really as we made this consecration. We're flying to her protection, asking her help in this way. Now, Pope Benedict also notes that the reflections of St. Bernard were characteristic of someone in love with Jesus and Mary are still a good stimulus, not only for theologians, professional theologians, those in the guild, but for all believers almost 900 years after they were written or delivered. Now, some people back in his time claimed to have solved the fundamental questions on God, the human person, and on the world with the powers of reason alone. And they're trying to do it today as well. All right? Um, now, St. Bernard, solidly founded on the Bible and the, and the writings of the fathers of the church, reminds us that without a profound faith in God, nourished by prayer, and contemplation by an intimate relationship with the Lord. Our reflections on the divine mysteries risk becoming an empty intellectual exercise, losing their credibility. Theology leads us back to the knowledge of the saints, to their intuition of the mysteries of the living God and to their wisdom, a gift of the Holy Spirit, which becomes the reference for theological thought. Pope Benedict remarks that we need to recognize that we seek God better and find more God more easily in prayer rather than in discussion. In the end, the truest figure of a theologian, theologian and of, every, of every evangelizer remains the Apostle John, who had his head on the teacher's breast. Now, as I said earlier, one of the ways in which we might experience this encounter with the Lord would be through works of mercy. So, that in particular is what we see in the other four people I want to talk about now. Now, we're still in France, but now we're moving ahead about 450, about 500 years to Vincent de Paul. Now, his dates are 1580 to 1660. Now, Vincent de Paul did not have any great religious motivation in becoming a priest. You know, what he wanted to do was a way for him to get ahead, make some money, and take care of his family. That was his motivation initially for becoming a priest. All right? Now, uh, and his family was all for this as well. They had sacrificed for this to happen, and they expected to have some of the payoff as well from, as he got a wealthy benefice. That's, that's what the expectations are. Not very high, not very holy. But one day, uh, Vincent heard the deathbed confession of a dying servant. And it just shocked him. It just really shook him to the core. Because then his eyes got opened up to the conditions of the, the working poor uh, the, in France. And the eyes, the crying needs of the peasantry in France. Now, at that point, he was working with the Countess of Gandhi. And you know, one of her servants, that's confession he'd heard, he was, and he was working with her servants. 
She persuaded her husband to endow and support a group of able and zealous priests who would work among poor tenant farmers and country people in general. And there was never, you know, the rich always have people who look after them, but it's always it's a challenge of people who are willing to work with the poor. All right. And initially, she said, Vincent, you're the one who should be in charge of all this. But he said he was too humble to accept this at first. But then he spent some time, and I'm not quite sure of the chronology here, but he was among some imprisoned galley slaves. And he came back from that experience, and he said, yes, I will do this. And he became the leader of what, was, what became known eventually as the Congregation of the Mission, or more recently, the Vincentians. All right? Now, these priests with vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience were devote themselves entirely to people in the smaller towns and villages, not among the rich, not among the well-heeled, not among the powerful. They were supposed to work. This is where they were supposed to do their work. Now, a next step for Vincent was establishing what he, what he called confraternities of charity for the spiritual and physical relief of the poor and the sick of each parish, because he saw that was something really was a crying need as well. Now, his first way to try this was to work among aristocratic ladies and getting them, he thought if they get them involved with working with the poor, that could really change things. It was a great idea. But often what, the, what these ladies would do, they would say, I'm too busy to do that. So they'd send their servants to go do it. And the servants, uh, when they who really were, this is this, they're doing this under sufferance, didn't like working with the poor and treated not very, very well. So Vincent realized that plan A wasn't working so well. So what he had to do was come up with a plan B uh, and trying to figure out how could he get this. And he also realized, you know, that he needed a lot more workers to really be effective in this work. And he thought that, you know, ideally some of the young country girls you know, are strong and used to hard work, they would be wonderful at the kind of work we need to do with these whose works of mercy, feeding the poor, etc. But he's thinking, how am I going to recruit them? And how am I going to find someone who's going to help me to lead them? Well, at this point, this is when Louise de Merillac steps into the picture. Now, Louise, her dates are 1591 to 1660. She was a widow and uh, you know, it was a prayerful woman. You know, we call her, we say she was a pious woman. And one of her, her, her confessors was St. Francis de Sales. He was, was a contemporary of Vincent de Paul. And he was, he was working, but Francis de Sales was a very, very busy man. And he couldn't always give her the attention that she would, might want because of, he was traveling, he was writing, doing lots and lots of work. Well, then Francis died. And then Francis also asked Vincent, he said, he had been Francis himself had been working with Saint Jane de, Jane de Chantal, and founding the Visitation Sisters, and again, their idea was to be able to do works of mercy. And what happened with them was the other bishops in France and said, Vince, you know, Francis, this is not going to work. It's too dangerous for women to be out doing this kind of thing. They need to be enclosed in a monastery, uh, they, and they need to be. Uh, and so anyway, so they, this was actually forced upon them, so they had sort of changed their way of life. Vincent remembered this experience for what was going to happen. Uh, so eventually, he, you know, Louise, at first he was, he was bothered by this, but as he got to know Louise over time, he realized, maybe this is an answer for me. Because he, he began to say that she was actually, even though she was had, had did have some health problems. She was actually very, very strong. She was intelligent. She was a good organizer. So he thought, maybe she's the one that can help me recruit and form some of these young girls uh, and to, to do the work that needs to be done. And also work with some of the, so she was an aristocratic lady, work with some of the other aristocratic ladies as well. Being a peer might work more effectively than just him as a priest. Uh, anyway, in, in both fronts, she did really very, very well. So, uh, so eventually we started to recruit some young women, and then she wrote a rule for them, and we under Vincent's guidance. Now, Vincent again remembered he had this experience of the Visitation Sisters, and so he was also he never lost. He was sort of a, a cunning peasant, 
So he was very shrewd. So he thought, we have to take our time with this. So he told, the, 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 as he gathered, uh, you know, these, uh, his daughters, he said, don't think of yourselves as sister. You know, you can call us that form of, but we're not religious, you know. Uh, and so we just very, very, very slowly, very, very carefully. And only after a period of years, just he, I, I see, really wanted to think part of it was really having the idea established, seeing others around, get used to the idea so they wouldn't jump in and say, they need to be enclosed nuns. Because that's not what the Daughters of Charity were called to be. So what they did was they just uh, would, do, would do the work. And eventually, one of the things that was a crying need was taking care of, 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 of foundlings. And some of the girls did not know how to read. They thought, I don't know how to take care of children. But eventually, he said, let's work together. We could work out a way. So taking care of foundlings and running orphanages became a very important work of the Daughters of Charity, particularly working with girls. And that's important with the European thing. Didn't want to work so many so with boys, but they wanted to work with girls. All right. So, um, you know, anyway, so that's what developed over time. And as I said, he was slow and prudent in dealings with Louise and the new group. Um, you know, he said, he, tell, he said to the daughters that your convent will be the house of the sick, your cell, a hired room, your chapel, the parish church, your cloister, the streets of the city, or the wards of a hospital. Their dress was to be that of the simple peasant women. That's ironic considering what happened over time, that uh, you know, the Daughters of Charity before, they had this long, very distinctive coronet, you know, which we had. That was not what they envisioned. They were just were supposed to wear ordinary dress of the women of the time. And women, I guess, in 17th century France often would wear a coronet. Uh, but not quite as fancy as it developed, because they said over time it went further and further out. You got to the point where my aunt was, had worked at a hospital with the Daughters of Charity. She said, how do you ever work in an operating room with that? I said, we have to pin it up, because otherwise we turn around and we hit the doctor in the face. <laughs> but anyway, but that, so, but anyway, they did eventually take annual vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and um, and then eventually they would be, became a religious, religious congregation, proved by Rome under the direction of Vincent's own congregation of priests. Now, another thing I should say was the transformation that happened in Vincent's own life over time. By temperament, he was very irascible. He was, he was quick tempered, prone to be sarcastic. And he said that, but except for the grace of God, he would have been hard and repulsive rough and cross. But he became a tender and affectionate man, very sensitive to the needs of others. Now, a story to show how this worked out. Like many busy priests, he was called to be on different works. And one of the things he was asked to be part of would be uh, helping the queen mother of you know, her husband, the king of France, had died. Her son, who would be, become the king, was, was a minor, so his mother became the queen regent. She wanted to gather around a group of priests to advise her in the appointment of bishops, all right? Now, things in the 16th, 17th century France, and this is also true, by the way, in England, in the Anglican countries, the way the hierarchy were chosen, the way things worked, the eldest son inherited the title. Then the other sons, if they were fit, the proper thing was to go into military service. If they weren't, uh, then they became a cleric, all right? Now, depending on how a family reviewed themselves, they thought, well, our sons ought to, who are clerics, ought to be bishops, all right? And then the way things would go, this would go to the, the king or the queen of France, and the Holy See was bound, basically, if, that, if the king of France wanted Father So-and-so to be the Archbishop of Paris, that's what happened, all right? Now, Vincent being on the council, he tried to be uh, really inject some reality into things. One of the major archbishops of France died, I think it was in Lyon, but I won't swear to that. And this one no particular noble family had their eye on it. This is where I said I saw not to be the bishop. That would be a good place for him, suitable considering where our family stands in society, etc. So they were pressing. They were, they were making the full court press that he be named the next archbishop of the city. 
He was all of about 23, 24. And he wasn't, even though he was ordained a priest, he wasn't leading a very priestly life. He spent all this time in taverns, gambling, uh, drinking, and also um, with sexual scandals as well. Not at all priestly. So Vincent went to the, the Queen Mother, the Queen Regent, and said, Your Majesty, with all due respect, he can't be a bishop. So she told all these things, and she said, Father, you've convinced me, but you have to tell his mother. <laughs> so what Vincent did, he went with another young priest to see the mother of this uh, would-be archbishop to tell him that, in fact, he wasn't going to get picked. So she, in a rage, she said, how dare you? Do you know we're one of the most uh, noble families in France? And who are you, anyway? to tell me such a thing. So in her anger, she threw a chair at him, hit his face, cut him, and he was, as he was bleeding, uh, you know, the other priest wanted, the younger priest wanted to protest, and he said, mm -mm. So he walked out, all he said was afterward when they left was, isn't it wonderful to see such a fierce love of a mother for her son? <laughs> you, know, you know, one of the ways you can tell, and what you're really growing in this spiritual life will be seeing, are the fruits of the Holy Spirit really evident? Charity, joy, peace, patience, mildness, long-suffering, you know, that list. Uh, that, that, that's one of the real things that you can really see. That's a sign of his real growth in the spiritual life, that he, he who had been by temperament very prone to anger had become, as I said, uh, affectionate and very sensitive to the needs of others. All right. Now, the church is for all of God's children, for rich and poor, peasants and scholars, sophisticated and the simple. Now, the greatest concern of the church must, must be for those who need the most help, those who are made helpless by sickness, poverty, ignorance, cruelty, or war. Now, so Vincent de Paul and Louise de Marillac are particularly important for Christians today who hunger, whose hunger, when hunger becomes starvation, and the high living of the rich stands in more and more glaring contrast to the physical and moral degradation in which many of God's children are forced to live. And one of the things, just to say that, we, whereas we have this awful war going on in the Ukraine, but one of the things that's really marvelous, if there is a silver line for such a thing, is seeing the response that's happening, particularly in some of the neighboring countries, taking in refugees, religious houses, you know, like, well, you know, reading a column today from a man who's usually pretty skeptical uh, of the institutional church saying, I've got to give it a hand. This is one case where I'm, I'm ready to raise my glass, cheering what the institutional church is doing, particularly in Poland, which is very institutional. They're all organized. They're all taking in refugees. Convents are, are working, are working very, very hard just to make sure take people are taken care of. That's a silver line, because that's what should happen. And thank God is what is happening in, in our day as well. Uh, and there's also, by the way, there's just there's another little story of a nun, uh, from, a Dominican nun from Spain. She was talking with her sisters. They're contemplatives, but they were working among Ukrainian refugees. So she and someone with their aide said, let's, sister, let's go, to, let's go to the border and see if we can find any families who can ring back. So they drove 2,000 miles each way to the border and found six women and their children had nowhere to go and said, then come with us to Spain. And then let's go back. So she had to use all of her skills at various checkpoints in the border to get them through because one of the families didn't have all the right paperwork. But you know, this is where the power of the veil, I guess, really can work. So she's able to get them there. But it's just stories like this are starting to come out. Really, it's the best of the church. All right. Anyway, but and really very much in the spirit of Vincent and Louise. All right. Now. Still in France, we're going to move ahead about 150 years. By this point, the French Revolution has come and gone. The reign of terror is over. And the church in the 19th century France is starting to rebuild after all of the devastation that had happened in the late 18th century. We have Frederick Ozenham, 1853-1853. Ozenham, he was the fifth of Jean and Marie Ozenham's 14 children. But only, even though there were 14 children, only three of them lived to, be, lived to adulthood. And 11 children died before they were, you know, as children. 
Now, Frederick wanted to study literature. So he was a good student, but his father, who was a physician, was more practical. He said, no, you need to study law. So that's what Frederick did. He went to Sorbonne from, uh, to study, study there. And when certain professors mocked Catholic teachings, he would be there to defend the church. Now this, so Frederick organized a discussion club. He was, he was a leader. And, and this, this was part of the spark, the turning point in his life. In the club, Catholics and atheists and agnostics would debate issues of the day. Now, once after Frederick had spoken about the role of Christianity in civilization, one of the club members who was either an agnostic or an atheist said, well, let's be frank, Mr. Ossinum. Let's also be very particular. What do you do besides talk to prove the faith that you, uh, to prove the faith you claim is, you, the faith that you claim is in you? Now, he was really stung by that because he wasn't, he wasn't, there was lots of talk, but he said, I really don't do that much direct contact with the poor. How am I going to do it? So, so, so at this point, he and a friend began visiting tenements and to offer assistance the best they could. But they're college students. What do they really know? What kind of experience do they have? Well, this is where Rosalie Rondu comes into the picture. Rosalie Rondu was the daughter of charity. She uh, was born in 1786 and raised in a farm in, the, in southern France. Her, her family during the Reign of Terror, they would shelter priests who were on the run, and from one of these priests, she made her first communion. In 1802, after religious houses were reestablished in France, she entered the Daughters of Charity. And in 1815, 13 years later, clearly a woman of, of ability, she was named the superior of their house in Paris. And that house became a meeting place uh, where intellectuals and others concerned about social con questions or people wanting training would come. And that's, and that's who trained Frederick in the early Vinc uh, people, the Vincentians and how to do this. She'd say, come and let me give you the experience. We have you know, centuries of work on this. This is what we've learned. This is what, this is what these are the kind of things work. These are kind of the kinds that are effective. This is what you say. This is the, these are the kind of attitudes that you have. All right, now, Eventually, uh, Frederick earned his law degree, and he taught law at the University of Lyon. Then he got he earned a doctorate in literature, and he came back to the Sorbonne, and he taught there as well. At this point, the idea of the conferences uh, was, was really taking off, because we're talking about the early industrial period, people moving in from the farms into the cities, and those working in the factories, uh, working under horrible conditions. You know, uh, the, you know the, the, the area that lived, where they were living was there was disease-ridden. Um, you know, there was children denied opportunity for education, child labor, all kind of the social ills that you found in the 19th century. And these are kind of things that the Vincentius were trying to address. Now, un, unremarkably, you know, violence marked the 1830s and 1840s in France. In the Revolution of 1830 and 1848, Sister Rosalie found her life imperiled when she protected victims of violence, regardless of what their, where their, their side was in the fights. You know, on one occasion, she intervened whenever an officer was going to be shot at the barricades, and she just simply said, we do not kill here. And she was effective. She could have been killed herself, but she wasn't. All right? So... And after the Revolution of 1848 in particular, many Parisians were in need of the services of the St. Vincent de Paul conferences. The unemployed numbered about 275,000. So the government asked Frederick and his co-workers to supervise government aid to the poor. Six a mark of their success. You know, as the Vincentians throughout Europe came to the aid of Paris. Now, one of his, Frederick's last activities was starting a newspaper called The New Era which is dedicated to the securing of justice for the poor and the working classes. Now, fellow Catholics are often unhappy with what he wrote, because Frederick challenged the church to renounce its alliance with the rich and the powerful, along with a nostalgia for a bygone pre-revolutionary era. In some ways, he reminds me, maybe he was even an inspiration for, in some way, for Dorothy Day in the 20th century with what he wrote. He said, the poor call Christians to conversion, they're messengers of God 
to test our justice and our charity to save us by our works. Now, his, his stance caused many fellow Catholics to be suspicious of him, and this left him isolated and discouraged. Now, plagued with poor health, Frederick died at the age of 40 in 1853. At his funeral, Father Jean-Baptiste Lacordaire, who was a renowned Dominican and good friend of his, said that Frederick was one of those privileged creatures who came direct from the hand of God, whom God joins tenderness to genius to enkindle the world. As for Sister Rosalie, she lived in 1856 and was beatified in 2003. Frederick was beatified in 1997. And about her, Pope St. John Paul II said, in an era troubled by social conflicts, Rosalie Rondu joyfully became a servant of the poorest, restoring dignity to each one. Her secret was simple, to see the face of Christ encounter in every human, man and woman. So there we have it. Six very different people from different eras of church history and their stories of their encounters with the Lord. Now, each one announcing by their words and actions that God must be first, notably in the commandments to love God with your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind, your whole strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. All right, so a final thought from our, uh, the musings of a missionary discipleship block noted from early this week. You know, just ask this as a question for us. Is your relationship with Jesus Christ feeling lukewarm or sterile? Even when we aspire to practice our faith sincerely and wholeheartedly, there are times when we may not hear Christ in our prayer or feel his presence during Mass. The solution? Pray anyway. Just remember what Woody Allen said, 80% of life is just showing up, all right? Go to Mass anyway. Uh, Pope Francis called for renewed, renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, but we must be present to experience it. We've got to show up, all right? How do we experience this? How we experience this? This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Catholic Church does offer many ways to experience our Lord intimately. As I said, the beginning prayer, the sacraments, Eucharistic adoration, scripture, works of mercy. Now, the Eucharist, of course, is the most intimate way in which Jesus is real for us. Each time we receive him in Holy Communion, we're plunged anew and more deeply into the great Paschal mystery of his passion, death, and resurrection. All right, so... Anyway, I will stop at this point and see if anyone has any questions for me, okay? It's either good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> or thoughts. Yes, Tony. Why do you think it's so hard for Catholics to say the name of Jesus and to um, think, um, promote an encounter with Christ? At least that's my experience. I think it's something we think is Protestant. Uh, and sometimes we may have encountered someone who, uh, I remember just remember once being on the bus and seeing someone who, who may have been very, very earnest, but just was doing it in a way that was off-putting and thinking, uh, this is not something I want. I remember my late father talking about, you know, when I was a kid, there was a uh, revival going on, and, and he snuck in under the tent, and one of the one things he would say, that one of the songs they had, put a nickel in the drum and be saved. And he said, he said, he said actually, that, that, that sounds like well, that was what would cause the Reformation. But I, th I think, but the way they would talk about things uh, could, could, could be something that makes, makes us uncomfortable, but I think, uh, it's something we can really work to get, I think work, work to get over, just because when you look at this, because we, when we proclaim the name of Jesus, uh, you know, as it's, it's, it's St. Bernard said so well, it's just like hunting on the tongue. Yes, Deacon Jim. Yeah, I'm struck that almost every one of these that you spoke of really started not doing what they wound up doing. I mean, they just, they saw a need, they were struck, they wanted to do something that didn't always work. They, you know, plan A's and plan B's. Uh, and you know, I can remember Monsignor Ralph uh, Keener talking about some of the things that he was involved in starting. And, and it took years. Uh, it took many different, you know, many going after the council for funding or, or doing something. Uh, and it took just years. But you have to, the faith that, you know, if you, if you have faith and you pray and you persevere, uh, good things will happen. And I think every one of these that I heard 
that's what struck me is, you know, they were just ordinary people. Yeah, Deacon Jim, Deacon Jim was, was, was also mentioning Father Ralph Kinney. He is a great example of this, because he would talk about, um, with, you know, over dinner, to different points about exactly this kind of thing, that whenever he was asked by the late Cardinal of Boyle to be the Secretary for Social Concerns, he said, anything but housing. And, and he said, oh, you don't, have to worry. You're not, you don't have to worry about housing at all. I said, of course, that was ironic, because that's exactly when the biggest parts of the work became over time. And then seeing how he was very dogged over time with, uh, as I said, going after, you know, going after the, you know, testifying on county level, testifying on state level, trying to make sure housing. And it all began, began he, when he was the pastor of Our Lady of Victory, there was a, a woman, elderly parishioner was in an apartment, and it was being transferred into condominiums, and she was being forced to leave. And the stress of it all, she died. And he remember him saying to me, we can do better than that. So that's one of the reasons that propelled him in that direction. So uh, that's, a, that's a great example of that. He was not planning on that, but that's what developed over time, and that's where really he was led. And he just, uh, just pursued it, and he just stuck to it. Mother Teresa would talk about the same experience, that if she really felt something was God's will, they would keep at it, so they really were sure it was something was something wasn't right. But he was, he was a great example of that kind of perseverance. Yes. Very different questions, all right. And let me think. What was no, just in turn, let me take the first, the second question first. I think with the with the receiving under both species, that will take some time because of the pandemic. Before we, we return to that, perhaps we'll be cautious about that. So we we'll just have to see. But we have to remember, though, there. You know, whenever we receive, just you know, we just receive the body of Christ. We're receiving the whole Christ, body and blood. Or if someone has, like has, has a cancer and they can't receive, uh, if they just receive the blood of Christ, they're receiving the whole Christ. I think that's an important thing to remember as well. So we're not missing out if we don't, if we don't have it because we're receiving the whole Christ whenever we receive communion. Now, um, I think it's helpful, you know, what the apostles, once they had the experience of Pentecost, that uh, they did become transformed individuals. Peter, who was timid before, became a bold proclaimer from what he, what he experienced. So how this could happen in our lives may happen in different ways. I think, again, Vincent de Paul, after he heard that confession, uh, that he was a changed person. So that's how the Holy Spirit worked in that instance. Holy Spirit works in different ways. And, and God knows what we need, and he makes sure that, that we have that, so that we're trying to provide what we need so that we can really grow in, in the life of grace and the life of the Trinity. Now, and then Melissa's trying to show me a sign, so I, which I can't see. So I'm, not, I'm not sure what all it's saying. <laughs> I'll repeat the question when you, when you get a question. All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yes, Tony. Well, Father John, once um, you said um, when people come with suggestions, if you feel it's a good suggestion, you try to stand out of the way, not become an impediment. And we saw that this week. And I just want to tell people, you know, how, how wonderful it was to hear after morning mass, one of the parishioners come up and say, I, I really feel called to um, collect socks and underwear for the refugee children. And we're going to begin doing that right after Easter. But this one parishioner felt that God was calling her to do that. And she stepped forward 
and asked if we could. I, I then talked um, with um, a father John, a right hand person, <laughs> Donna. We said, okay, but um, let's start right after Easter, and we're going to do that. And that, that's a really good example of um, this encountering and feeling a call and responding. Okay. What Tony was talking about was a recent experience where you know, a person was really moved, moved to begin a work of mercy, collecting clothing. And you know, sometimes my job is to, you know, stand, is to write checks and stand out of the way of the work of the Lord, because I don't want to be involved. You know, I don't want to be an impediment. Just like Cardinal O'Connor and more recently Cardinal Dolan said about the canonization of Dorothy Day. This is a work of God. I don't want to get in the way of it. You know, I think that's important just to be out of the way just so that the work can happen. But sometimes we may be moved to do something and we just want to have an encouragement. Like years and years ago, I think it was second trip Pope John Paul II made to the United States. So there's this farmer in Iowa who said, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Pope would come to Iowa to see a farm? Well, the parish priest, he said, that'd be great. I'll pass it along. But he's thinking, Holy Father's not going to come to Iowa. So the priest took it to the bishop. He said, that's a great idea. But he's thinking, Holy Father's not going to come to Iowa. So then he took it up to the bishop's conference. He said, well, I'm sure the Pope wants to see this, this, and this. Uh, but he's not going to come to Iowa. We got to the Vatican, Pope John Paul II, I'm going to Iowa. <laughs> so you just never know with something. You just, you just have to see if it's, if it's the work of the Lord, then you want to make sure you're behind it and not in the way of it. One more question, if there is one. Yes, Ruth. Father John, um, do you think that the parishioners here realize that we have the St. Vincent de Paul Society active in this parish and, um, and in our archdiocese? Do you think people are aware of that? Ruth, that is a great question. She's asking, are people in the parish aware that we have a St. Vincent de Paul conference here in the parish and also in the archdiocese? Not as much as I would like us to be, because Father Ralph Keener, a blessed memory, said every parish ought to have one. And whenever we were, whenever we were starting to do the work, Dan Tony has been very, very helpful, and we're helping organize it here with that kind of work. Um, you know, so I'm actually hoping to raise the profile and just talk about it some more, because we could use some more workers in the conference. Now, you know, we've had some wonderful experiences. One of the things we had recently was dealing with a man, and as it shows, different streams coming together. We have you know, this wonderful organization called uh, you know, um, you know, for Refugees, New and NIA. Uh, you know, anyway, anyway, but it, they, they it come to their attention. There was a family, a man in Prince George's County, who was doubly amputee. His wife had died as well, and, his, and was at the funeral home, and the funeral home was charging an exorbitant amount of money. They, they weren't, it wasn't, body wasn't going to get released until that money was paid. So the question came up. So I took her to the St. Vincent de Paul conferences in the county through Tony's help. And I talked with the pastor, and he said, let's do this. We, we got things down to about $1,500. Our parish will pay half of it if you can, if you can collect the money from the others. So that we did that. So the money's gone in so the man could bury his wife. Basic uh, work of mercy. But that, that's the kind of work we do, the conference does. And it's, it's not the only case we've done something that, that basic, just helping people like that. It's a wonderful work. I would love to see more people involved with it. You know, it is, it is, it is a commitment, but it's very, very rewarding. So thank you, Ruth. That's a great question. Okay. At this point, I think we'll just say a prayer and we'll call the night, okay? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful, 
O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise on our petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. All right. Thank you very much for coming and indulging me as I broke Mrs. Becker's law. <laughs>